Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, welcome. And thank you so very much for being with Dr. Stephen G. Post, uh, or Professor Post, and me, Kim Serafini. As you know, I'm the founder, CEO, creator of Positive Prime. This particular community um, has this exquisite opportunity right now to get to know Stephen. Even though I'm expecting that you've all done as was very kindly requested, and that is um, have a look at his best selling books, even buy it in advance. Um, I've also asked that everybody watch his TED talk, read his websites, um, whether it's the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love or Stephen G. Post.com. That's an S T E P H E N. Uh, gpost.com. But I don't want to take one second away from listening to Stephen. We find you on Long Island. Um, one of our exquisite, amazing, extraordinary, lovely leaders, Patty Crummer and I came visited you there at Stony Brook a couple of years ago. Um, Stephen, I have said this to the people I really care about who know me so well. I, I think that you are the most influential human being in my entire life. Now, I realize I'm only 47, so I might not say that at 87, but today it's the truth. Um, when I saw you speak at Happiness and Its Causes, a conference that was probably about 12 years ago now, and you were presenting in the most eloquent way, I was captivated but you literally changed the trajectory of my life and I'd already written I am grateful for life. The reality is is that we talked about um, in a very brief time after that presentation or that speech these moments of divinity that we experience in life and um, it was almost like you gave me permission to really reflect on these profound experiences that I'd had that I wanted to elevate and then I wanted to create more of. Well, a long way down the track, here we are at Positive Prime and I actually watch your session, It's Good to Be Good, to remind me to hold myself to a higher standard. So um, we have people here who love positive psychology. They're really learning about the neuroscience of change. We developed a very practical tool that um, facilitates a state change in whoever watches these beautiful visual interventions. But beyond that, I just want people to really tap into you as the kind of human being who has contributed more to humanity than anyone I know. Like anyone I know. I'm not sure. I'm not so certain, but anyway, okay. See, and that is exactly the response that, that, is, that is you because you're so humble. So let's just start with, um, let's start with the fact that there are people here who may not have read your um, beautiful book about Route 80 and God and your life's journey, which is just such a delightful tale. Um, I was enthralled from cover to cover and I, you know, I lent it to somebody and I'm like, no, 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 I bring it back. I've got more people to lend it to. Um, so tell us, if we only had five minutes with you, what's the one lesson that we absolutely need to integrate into our lives and our identity. And then we'll move on from there. The one lesson. Um, I have a favorite quote from Eleanor Roosevelt. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. I'll say that one more time. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And although I've been teaching in medical schools uh, for 35 years and um, have been active in lots of different professional ways, the real bottom line is that my life got started 
seriously started when I was about 15. And I had a recurring dream at a school in New Hampshire called St. Paul's. And that dream set me on a course across the United States on Route 80 from the George Washington Bridge outside of Manhattan all the way to San Francisco. So God and love on Route 80. And it's all about synchronicity and uh, that sense of being brought together in a purposeful way that really involves a kind of energy of love that permeates the universe and that we can be affected by in a very direct way. So that's the spiritual side. But then on a more mundane level, uh, you know, I, I had the honor of uh, <clears throat> helping to introduce Sir John Templeton to Martin Seligman in about 1997 at the Philadelphia Marriott Hotel in Philadelphia on Market Street. And, and Sir John had this idea about the laws of life, about kindness and gratitude and forgiveness. And he'd written a book called The Essential Laws of Life. And I was honored to write the foreword to it. Um, Sir John and I were very close. <clears throat> and he wanted a scientist who could take these classical character strengths and actually um, bring the best uh, methods of science to them so that we could really begin to understand how they enhance uh, our mental and physical health and even our longevity. So uh, Marty, who had, up until that point had been best known for his theories on complete hopelessness, called learned helplessness actually. If you humiliate, uh, uh, if you beat a dog down enough at a certain point, it will not even get off the floor. And um, humiliation is such a terrible problem in our world. So many people have so many gifts and wonderful talents. Everybody, in my view, without exception, is a, a wonder of the universe, a miracle of creation. Everybody has gifts. And our purpose in life is to discover and help one another to discover those gifts and then to use them to contribute to the lives of others. And it always works out. It's that that's how we also flourish in the bargain. So that's my basic philosophy of, of life. And, and uh, when I was, I taught at the medical school at Case Western in Cleveland for 20 years before I came here 12 years ago to Stony Brook. Um, and I was sitting in my office in the summer of 2000, I received a, a fax from Sir John Templeton, who at that time was about 88. And he, okay, he did not email. It, you know, his generation, he, he, it was too much for him, but he loved the fax machine. He thought it was literally the greatest invention ever. And he could fax a mile a minute. So I would sometimes get, you know, three, four, five faxes from Sir John. And since he was a billionaire investor, the Templeton funds and all that, uh, you know, I tended to want to put things down and actually respond. And so we'd worked a lot together and we'd worked in areas uh, that many of you are familiar with. Uh, um, in, in fact, in, in, you know, the first summer of positive psychology was the summer of 2000 where Marty had um, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, George Valiant, uh, Bob Enright, Ev Worthington. I was, I was there as sort of the, the token philosopher, if you will. And, uh, we had a great summer. Uh, Sir John really funded all of positive psychology. That's how it, be, it became real. Um, but uh, uh, a little later that year, I was, I'm in my office and I get this fax from, from Sir John. And it said, Stephen, we need to start an institute that studies the greatest asset, which is love. And he said, not just human love, but I hope you're sitting down, everybody, the love that made humans. In other words, he wasn't just talking about interrelational love. I call that uh, relational spirituality. But he was talking about that more vertical sense of love where we can be sitting here in our offices and suddenly somebody just feels this energy of love and it's intuitive. And, you know, I've done this, I once turned around and I didn't see anything there. 
I had a student who came in uh, and she was very distressed. She was thinking about leaving med school. She came from the Queens, from a Korean American area. And, and it was kind of a evangelical Korean street world that she grew up in culturally. So it was hard for her to adjust. And, and so she came in to see me and, and just talk about her life. And I said, look, um, I got a lot of appointments today. Why don't you email me? And I will, um, I'll get back to you and, and, and we'll see each other next week. But I've just, right here at this desk, I felt this incredible energy. I turned my chair, I actually, there's nothing to see obviously, but I just felt this powerful energy. And my intuition was whatever I'm doing today, just drop it, okay, just drop it. And I did, I canceled all my appointments and I said, stay right here. And I spent the next three hours with her and I became her mentor and she wrote a beautiful series of published essays on acculturation to medical school. Um, and and, and it, it, she's now practicing preventive medicine in Connecticut um, and it's having a wonderful life. But, uh, and my wife and I would even go into Queens uh, and uh, about every month or so, and I'd take her, uh, uh, this young lady, to a Korean tea shop, and we'd talk for a while and connect. And the thing is that I would never have done that just on my own. The only reason I did that, the only reason, was because I felt this love energy, and that changed the whole dynamic. So... Um, what Sir John was saying is that there's something in this universe that's bigger and more powerful and astonishing than human love, not to put human love down. And he was okay with human love. He thought sometimes it was myopic, was unwise, a little bit overindulgent. Sometimes, uh, you know, it would peter out, flicker and so forth. Uh, it could be impure, um, but he just felt that there was this powerful love energy uh, and so, uh, so I, I, I faxed him back. I said, Sir John, let's do this. Let's start this uh, program. What should we call it? And he faxed me back. This is on that morning at Case Western in Cleveland. And uh, he said, let's call it the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Now, you got to understand, I'm, I'm, I do Alzheimer's genetics and such things, and I'm pretty okay with the pure biological world around the and I had a moment of trepidation. I'm just being honest. This is a confession. So I asked back to Sir John. Sir John, maybe we should call it the Institute for Creative Altruism. Because, you know, so, you know, altruism is kind of an acceptable word in psychology and sociology and even evolutionary biology, right? The selfish gene and altruism and all these things. And he facts back. Uh, he said, no, Stephen. Um, Unlimited Love, Institute for Research on Unlimited Love, up to $8.9 million. And uh, he's in Lyford Key in Nassau. And so I faxed back. Now, I'm wondering what Angela would have faxed back, or any of you. <laughs> I, I faxed back. Sir John, I love that language. It jumps right off the page. And, and so we were born. But he was so right, because he wanted to uh, encourage me not to just kind of, if you will, you know, uh, bring it down to the purely materialist metaphysic. He wanted it to be engaged with these higher metaphysical principles and realities. And, and, uh, and it worked out beautifully. Uh, and he, again, he was 100% correct when, just FYI on Sir John, he died in, in 2008 and I was moving from Cleveland on Route 80 to Long Island. So I was driving east on Route 80. Um, and um, I got a call from his son, Jack Templeton, who was a pediatric trauma surgeon at the Children's Hospital in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and I had a flip phone at the time, got this call from Jack. And it said, Stephen, dad is dying, meaning Sir John, because he was 96 or 97 years old. Um, and he has a favor to ask of you. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, that Sir John is, is that ill. Uh, I'd do anything for Sir John. Um, what's he want? 
And Jack said, well, he's dying and he wants to write a book, but he's not going to have time. He'd written some brief books here and there, but he's not going to have an opportunity to write this. So he wants you to write it for him. <laughs> you know, that's not something you necessarily want to do for anybody else, you know, because you can never tell exactly what should be in it. But, he's, but Jack said, yeah, he wants it to represent his, his highest ideals. And, and, and so I said, well, Jack, did he give you a title? <laughs> Jack said, yeah. He said, <clears throat> unlimited love is ultimate reality. Very metaphysical. And, um, and I said, Jack, that's okay. I think we can do that. But could I ask you to do me one favor? Go back to your dad and ask him if we could have a question mark. Because that would put a little less pressure on you. So he came back like three or four minutes later. And he was sort of, sort of panting a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dad said, is ultimate reality unlimited love? Question mark is okay. So I wrote that for the Templeton Press and, and tried to capture the real essence of Sir John. Because, you know, uh, foundations tend to get away from that. They tend to drift a little bit with every generation. And I wanted... And he wanted um, to try to do what we could to keep things uh, true to his own uh, somewhat controversial, um, you know, very Upanishadic, uh, one mind type thinking. Um, I mean, he was a Presbyterian, but he was also a, a, a you know member of a Unity School of Christianity, which was all Emersonian, Oversoul, and all these kinds of things, and so. Uh, you know, if you read Larry Dossie's book, One Mind, which I recommend, that's a good example of how Sir John um, thought. And I actually had the opportunity to introduce Sir John and Larry Dossie at a golf club in Virginia in 1991. And they loved each other because they just had this idea that mind couldn't be explained in terms of just matter and cells and so forth, that that mind is its own infinite reality, mind before matter, you know, and everything else may be derived from mind, but not the other way around. So I got very lucky and, and, and I've, so I've been able to have the Institute, which is the more metaphysical side, but it does other things too. And then um, um, the good to be good, why good things happen to good people, the benefits of kindness and and giving, that's been a big theme. Um, and that's how I met Kim at, at, in Sydney at the convention center in Sydney Harbor, I think it was, right? Um, but I've also been very involved with um, what I call deeply forgetful people. Uh, so all my life I've been interested in folks with uh, dementia, but I don't like to call them demented, quote unquote. So. I have a book coming out in about six months with Johns Hopkins uh, called Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People. And I've always worked in very practical ways with caregivers. Um, and then the other thing is I've, you know, I've had to have a day job. Don't quit your day job. If you have a successful book, let me tell you, do not quit your day job because everybody I know who's done that, they've gotten into trouble, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and even now, especially with the COVID stuff, you know, the invitations to go traveling around and get uh, fees for speaking at big conferences, they pretty much entirely evaporated. So, so I've taught in medical schools and um, I, I run a center for medical humanities, compassionate care and bioethics, which is to say that it's mostly about teaching clinicians and nurses of all kinds and students about uh, real techniques of empathic communication, attentive listening through simulations and all kinds of um, methods that we use. And this past year, just a few months ago, I'm happy to say that this program won the um, National Alpha Omega Alpha Award for uh, programs in professional identity formation all across America. And that's like the you know, the creme de la creme medical society. Um, so I've, I've always um, really believed, as Sir John believed, that love heals. And I've tried to teach uh, 
you know, generations of medical students now that that's really true. And it's been actually um, nice because they all know that anyway in their hearts. They all know that. But sometimes uh, the systems they're working in and the pressures for revenue and so forth, uh, you know, chronological time, uh, you know, they, 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 they get routinized and they lose the, uh, you know, the empathy and the compassion and the connectivity, which is bad for patients, but it's bad for them because uh, that means that they've lost the music for a while anyway, and a lot of them burn out. And some of them, like one physician I know, uh, quit medicine is, and is now at the New York Culinary Institute. Although cooks have burnout too. You know, it's not an easy field. <clears throat> so I've just been very fortunate and, and I've, I've always stayed on Route 80. I've always followed my journey. I've never made my life. I, I think anybody who says, well, I made my life is just kidding themselves. I think that's just insane. I mean, what we do is we, we have a little faith in the future. We travel down the roads that we're given. And in synchronicity, you know, we encounter people like I encountered Sir John in a, well, that's a long story right there, but have encountered many people and my responsibility was really to affirm them and to respond to them and to create meaningful relationships and to be trustworthy. And so uh, the journey, journey was there. I actually quit a PhD program in immunology at University of Pennsylvania to go to the University of Chicago Divinity School uh, and uh, study with Mersha Eliade when he was writing his book on shamanism. Amazing guy with all these ET tufts of hair coming out of his ear. He was incredible. And you could hardly understand him because it was this sort of crazy um, uh, uh, Eastern European, French, American <laughs> <laughs> it was just impossible, but he was great. He was a genius and really the greatest historian of spirituality and religion and shamanism of the 20th century. And then the, this one particular quarter, uh, Joseph Campbell was there. So I got to sit with Joseph Campbell and Mersha Eliade in the Swift Kick coffee shop in the bottom of Swift Hall at the University of Chicago Div School. And I told them my story about my Blue Angel dream when I was 15 and stealing my father's car and leaving it on, uh, on Route 80 in Pennsylvania and going out west and all the things that happened to form my life early on. And um, it, it was incredible because they took it very seriously. I mean, Eliade said, um, synchronicity, not luck. And um, Joseph Campbell said, you, you know, follow the path. And, 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 and so I, I had the opportunity to be around people of that type at a, at a very formative point in my life. And, and so I've just, like I said, you know, uh, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams, even though there are some difficult times and sometimes you have to expand the canvas into something beautiful when it started out with a real disaster. I had those experiences, but you always have to build and broaden. Uh, and uh, so I've been lucky and I've run into people like Kim and, and i um, always very, very grateful for the um, amazing blessings of my life. You know, <clears throat> there are very few human beings that we work with or that we get to be in conversation with who actually make us feel more peaceful and more hopeful. And that's who you are in the essence of your beingness. Um, I've shared with Stephen and I've shared definitely um, with our community that recently I'm lying in the operating theatre and the, um, the cardiologist who's performing the surgery is a very young, good looking, clearly dynamic um, surgeon. And whilst I'm having a permanent pacemaker implanted for some extreme situation, which the medical specialists actually don't understand why I've had like six cardiac arrests or why my heart stops or whatever. Mm. I'm, I'm there and 
like with this, with this dedication, I'm like, you know, guys, you should really Google Professor Stephen G. Post. You have to read his book, Good Things Happen to Good People, right? So this is, this is the moment where my life, like it actually makes me quite um, emotional, but my life is literally in the balance. Mm. But I also know that there is an infinite love that is holding me. Otherwise, I wouldn't possibly be in that situation because I wouldn't have survived the most recent of my um, cardiac pauses. <laughs> And so I know I'm meant to be alive and I know that I'm supposed to get beyond myself to contribute to the world in a really meaningful and significant way and be the positive that I am, right? Or be who, who I was born to be and interview people like you. But what is it about your message? Just so that everybody gets it and goes out and shares it, why is it important to really be a good person and how is that defined like we we how do we know someone's a good person but much more importantly how do we know we are a good person small questions and what an experience you've had i'm glad it's it looks like things have turned out pretty well for you yeah but you're now a well, woman. You're, you're you're a bionic woman <laughs> You know, it's interesting, um, as an aside, I wrote, as you know, a best-selling book called I Am Grateful for Life. And it almost seems like an irony or indeed a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I used to talk about, oh, Stephen Post once told me that when we feel a very deep and profound, intense emotion of appreciation and gratitude and thankfulness, there's actually a different way that our cardiovascular system responds. Like yeah. I remember you saying that and I'm like, so it's a good thing to feel really grateful, but here's the crazy thing now that I'm on the other side of the last 18 months, that was almost an intellectualization. And I used to tell people to embody gratitude so that you feel this incredible thankfulness and keep searching inside of yourself until you access this exquisite nectar that is this incredible feeling that has so much goodness for your biology, right? If you want to biohack your way to health, get grateful and just experience and express and be loving, right? So, the fact is, is that I actually am like legitimately or literally so much more grateful for life, even though I actually thought I understood the concept, right? It's just a whole, whole different stratosphere these days. Absolutely. And, you know, um, we're actually working on a project right now with uh, NYU Medical School, Langone Hospital with Sam Parnia, P-A-R-N-I-A. And if anyone is interested in these experiences of resuscitation uh, after now, it can be five, six, or seven, eight minutes uh, where you're not, shall we say, of this world. Um, um, it's very profound and we're, met, we're studying people from around the world who have come back from these experiences, not just asking them, well, did you see a light, but, but trying to assess the personal transformation with regard to things like gratitude and kindness and purpose. And not everybody, uh, Kim, has your sort of testimony. Um, it's about half and half. Some people, it's just post-traumatic stress and they really struggle with it. But the other half do tend to become more deeply engaged in these um, very positive states. So we're looking at it um, really as a positive psychological investigation and, and not just, you know, did, did you see a tunnel? Although, you know, if people want to report that kind of thing, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, but always, uh, you know, if you look at um, Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich, little book by the Russian writer of all time. Uh, you know, Ivan Illich was just a terribly unkind person. And uh, in that book, he has this 
um, he's dying and uh, he hates everybody around him. Uh, he's totally narcissistic. And then he goes into what you would call a kind of near death experience, which is very well described uh, by, by Tolstoy. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the light and all those kinds of things. And, and then he comes out of it and his hand is out on his bed and his son's hand is on his hand. Uh, and for the first time ever in his life, Ivan Illich feels love for his son. Okay. And then his wife, who he's treated very badly over the years, um, comes in. For the first time, Ivan Illich feels love for his wife. And now he's a different being. Um, and so at that point... <clears throat> then now it's okay for him to die. So very soon thereafter, he just kind of stretches out and, and he passes on in peace. And the, the Russians call that, as did the Greeks, uh, the Ars Moriendi, the art of dying. It was very influential on Cicely Saunders, who started the hospice movement and uh, was, by the way, a great friend of Sir John. And I could tell you stories about Sir John and Cicely Saunders, but I won't. Uh, um, but... Uh, yeah, she really believed that, that that's why you needed pastoral care and um, psychologists and others in addition to pain uh, clinicians uh, there with the people who are moving on. But absolutely, so, so what you experienced is very powerful and very real. Um, and you're blessed because not everybody um, has quite that sort of a of a transformation. For some people, it's a lot more negative than for others. Well, I feel really blessed that I have had um, teachers in these um, relationships where I admire and respect people like you. So for the mm. last couple of decades, I've kind of been preparing myself for it. Mm. Um, but I also have an awareness of how fortunate I am that I'm not experiencing something like post-traumatic stress. Um, right. I am experiencing something like post-traumatic growth. And right. I've always been driven, but it is, it is at a completely... Oh, I should say a more refined level now. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm only a couple of weeks on the other side, really, in the grand scheme of things. Let's see how I am in 12 months' time or five years' time. Or... So may I make an observation? <laughs> okay. Sure. I think um, just interacting with you now, you've always been great and full of energy and vivacious and, and deep. But I think there's something about you that is a little more peaceful. Just to comment, you know, that somehow, you know, you're, you're in a little different place, a little different zone. And that's a good thing. You know, gratitude and kindness are, are very important because, um, you know, all these great neurological studies point out that <clears throat> when, when you're uh, deeply in a state of gratitude, um, or a state of kindness, the brain actually shuts off those negative emotional pathways, hostility, bitterness, resentment, <clears throat> which over time, you know, protracted are very bad for your health. It's just the same old story you all know about stress hormones, but, you know, ca cardiovascular disease, um, uh, slow wound healing, and then finally, and now it's no longer controversial, hippocampal atrophy. So 15 years ago, if you said to somebody, well, maybe stress contributes to Alzheimer's disease, they would laugh you out of the room. <clears throat> but not anymore. Now almost every neuroscientist in the world recognizes that uh, stress is um, one of the conditions that leads to this shrinkage of the hippocampus, which is one of the major benchmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And so when you think about it, um, you know, we, we, we live in a period that W.H. Auden, the poet, uh, termed and wrote a book called The Age of Anxiety. I mean, anxiety is everywhere. People are falling full chested on their horn because the person in front of them had the audacity to slow down at a yellow light. 
you know, and, and you should look at Long Island, try driving on the Long Island Expressway, you take your life in your hands. If you look at anybody wrong, you're in trouble. <clears throat> um, but there's so much anxiety and uh, somewhat exacerbated by this COVID uh, issue. Uh, so, uh, you know, to some degree, Alzheimer's, it has many relevant partial causes, including susceptibility genes and age itself and a lot of stuff, but, but um, anxiety and stress are a piece of the piece of the pie. So, uh, but the thing is that when you, when you're in a state of deep kindness and deep gratitude, you know, it's, it, the first time the idea of love your neighbor as yourself comes into literature that I'm aware of, <clears throat> well, there's some Upanishadic references to it, but at least in the Hebrew Bible, it's in Deuteronomy, and it says, do not seek vengeance or bear a grudge, but love your neighbor as yourself. See, that's really important. <clears throat> in other words, when you just turn and serve your neighbor, and get your mind away from the self and the problems of the self and this downward spiral of hostility and bitterness and rage and rumination. Um, uh, you know, just by making that kind of engagement and you have to reach out and, 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 and help people in small ways, but then the emotions catch up with that. At first you might be doing it more externally, but the, you know, as the James Lang theory of emotions points out, your, your, your emotional state shifts with the action. That's why you've probably heard the expression, smile even if you're not happy, right? Have you heard that? Yeah. yeah. So, so, the, so, so the brain, when it's in, when these networks of, of gratitude and kindness, compassion are turned on, it just shuts down all those uh, pathways that are associated with these very destructive emotional states. And so I love that Deuteronomy passage because it's really pretty too. There's another passage I like, you know, uh, perfect love casts out fear. It's very hard to have a lot of fear when you're truly loving someone. Oh yeah, definition of love. So I don't use a lot of Greek. I'm not a person with uh, the ancient languages on the tip of my tongue but there was a psychiatrist at the University of Chicago um, named Harry Stack Sullivan and he had a definition um, that goes like this and just think about it you know contemplate it. I mean it's it's really profound <clears throat> um, when the happiness and security of another is as real, sometimes he said as meaningful, as real or meaningful to me as my own, or sometimes more so, I love that person. So just think about it in everyday life, you know, um, uh, you know, you're looking over the crib of a child, you feel that way, you maybe you have a grandchild, you might feel that way, maybe you're just having a sip of coffee at Panera's with an old friend who's had a hard time. And so you're listening and um, affirming their lives and helping them to work through some things. <clears throat> you know, maybe somebody has never been told that their life is a miracle of the universe, and that they are a wonder of creation, and they've just been humiliated from day one. And so one of the things, one of the expressions of love that I like is celebration, just affirming people, letting them know how wonderful they, they are. And uh, so, I, you know, I, 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 when I get up in the morning, I get up in the morning about five o'clock, uh, even earlier, and I've done it since I was a teenager. <clears throat> and I kind of meditate, that's why what, good, why what good things happen to good people is about, you know, it's, it's, it's this idea of love at the core, but then, you, you know, how do you manifest that over the course of the day? And so, um, you know, some people, I actually, uh, M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled, with us, was a psychiatrist and a graduate of Case Western and a good friend of mine for many years who passed away at least 15 years ago. <clears throat> but we had a long correspondence and we coined a term together, which is in Why Good Things Happen, called carefrontation. 
as opposed to confrontation, because confrontation is like, you know, right? Uh, I mean, but how about carefrontation? I mean, it, I mean, that makes more sense because you, you know, you, so someone is kind of straying off track and they're deviating from their core integrity and you want to bring them back, you know, so you do that in a caring way and you maintain empathy. It's carefrontation. And that's the deepest form of friendship. Aristotle said that. He said the best friends you have are the ones who keep you true to yourself, not the ones necessarily you party with. Although they, that, that you can do that too. Don't get me wrong. It's all right. <clears throat> but, but yeah, so I, you know, I think that um, there are many manifestations of love, celebration, forgiveness, um, just simple helping activity, uh, compassion, attentive listening. Um, you know, creativity can be an expression of love. I come into these offices, a bunch of people work, uh, work. I, I supervise a lot of faculty and students and, and um, they get stuck on their creative projects and they really can't come up with the right method or the right idea. And they're struggling, they're losing sleep over it. So if I come in and I just sit down and say, well, have you thought about this? You know, just being a, a creative mentor, that's a form of love too. And, and so I get up in early in the morning and I meditate and I, um, I visualize most of the key people I'm going to see over the course of the day. I actually have an old fashioned book like this that has all the, you can't believe that anyone would ever have something like this anymore, but I have that. And so I can look at it and I know who I'm going to encounter. And, um, and I think to myself, sort of what do they need? You know, maybe somebody um, was just put aside by their spouse. And, and so they need someone who can be there and be present and be loyal to them. So loyalty is an expression of love in, in why good things happen. So I try to envision these things. And then over the course of the day, I do pretty well, you know, at, at connecting with people, um, not using the language of love because, you know, that's like off-putting for a lot of folks, to be honest, but, but you can figure out how to express or manifest it in this kind of circle of expressions. And I think that's, that's the way to go. That's a Route 80 philosophy, by the way. It is indeed. Um, and I do, I do love care frontation and I agree with Aristotle. Um, some of the most um, critical moments of my life have been when people have told me the truth that I didn't really want to hear or shown me what I didn't want to see. And so long as you're not overly provocative and people don't feel like they're being um, attacked, they yes. usually not all that defensive. Right. How you do it matters. <laughs> so, for example, you know, my wife and I, we have, we have two kids. Our first child, Emma, was born a long time, actually at the University of Chicago. And <clears throat> that summer we were in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we drove on Route 80, of course, back to New York. So my parents lived in New York and introduced them to young Emma, who was, you know, months old. And uh, my older sister, and this is okay because older sisters, they are, they are in the world to make sure that their little brothers kind of toe the path. Okay. She observed, she observed me with Emma for a while. And she said, you know, Stevie, you don't call me Stevie, but she, 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 she does. <clears throat> I never really liked you until you became a father. And I loved it because it's one of three times in my entire life when my sister has complimented me, complimented me. Not that she humiliated me, but she just never complimented, never said, you know, your life is not resting on a mistake. You know, it's not some, you know, something like that. So I, I was absolutely inspired by that. <clears throat> but still, I must acknowledge that it was a, you know, it was a little bit of an edgy way to be care frontation. <laughs> so, so that's an art form. And in the book, you know, I talk about people who are sort of velvet hammers. I mean, some folks, they can tell you what you need to hear, right? I mean, everybody can chime in on this. They can tell you what you need to hear, 
And if you're a supervisor, you know this, or if you're, a, you know, you have a sibling or whomever, you know. Uh, but somehow or another, it feels good, right? I mean, you feel uplifted, even if what they said was pretty, pretty tough to handle, you know. And so, not everybody can do that. I mean, it's a character strength. Some people can just do that. They just seem to be naturals. And uh, I'm I'm not not great at it. I mean, I I I can be. Um, sort of conflict aversive, you know, and just, you know, okay, I don't wanna necessarily travel there. <clears throat> but um, that may be one of my limitations because I could be better at care frontation uh, than I am. Isn't it interesting how um, you identify that and yet you coined the term? Haven't you found that in life, that which we uh, teach or we uh, discover and then we right is actually really some of the the acorns that will help us to grow into the oak trees oh yeah a lot of what we do is more remedial than we admit you know? absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> no, no question about it <clears throat> um so anyway, that's that. So that's what, what why good things happen is about. It's about all these different ways, and there are stories, and there are little self-assessment scales you can take. But in the end, now don't get me wrong. It's it's not that good things are the only things that happen to good people. Bad things happen to us all. So case in point, you know, I did not want to leave Case Western in Shaker Heights. Ohio, an inner ring suburb of Cleveland. I loved Cleveland. All my friends were there. We'd raised our family there. <clears throat> but there were politics at the university and financial issues were coming up. And um, uh, it just seemed like I wasn't going to be able to stay there as long as I had hoped. So I got this call from the president of Stony Brook saying they wanted someone to come here to the medical school, not just to start a bioethics program, you know, do you use a feeding pig in a 90 year old with progressive Alzheimer's? Probably not, that's a quandary, but no. How, can you create a cultural transformation so that the place becomes truly compassionate and caring as a community? And she thought, I, I could, she'd read why good things happen. She thought maybe I could try to do that. So I wasn't gonna do it, I had cold feet. And she knew that. And I, t I, I turned everybody here down. I actually came for an interview and I, I turned them down. They offered me the job. I said, no, I really can't do this. But then she called me and she said, Governor Elliot Spitzer, who at that time was the governor of the state of New York, <clears throat> I've spoken with him and he's going to give you a lot of money to start this program, not just at Stony Brook, at the other medical schools in Buffalo and around the state of New York and really revolutionize healthcare in New York. <clears throat> so that's, that was okay. And I thought, you know, with that kind of support, I'll give it a whack. So we sold the house and um, we're here on Long Island, the North Shore of Long Island, looking over the Long Island Sound to like New Haven, Connecticut. You can see it, it's just like, you know, 20 miles away. And, uh, it's raining, it's, it's, the lightning is so loud and the, the, and, and the thunder is so loud, the lightning is, 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 is huge and the rain was just coming down and we were in this pretty motley um, motel that had seen better days with lots of mildew in it, the Three Village Inn, which is right along the waterfront. So it's kind of got that, that feel to it. <clears throat> and um, my son was getting texts from his friends back in Ohio who were starting soccer. He's on the soccer team. And my wife couldn't, she doesn't like mildew. <laughs> so suddenly it was like the worst night in my life. My son, my, my wife, they were screaming at me. And I did, you know, like what maybe um, Tara would have done, looking at names here. <clears throat> uh, I said, okay, there's nothing I can do about it. This, it's already a done deal. Let me go out and get some pizza. 
So I went out in the car on Route 25A and I drove about five miles. I didn't know the neighborhoods. And I came to Little Joe's Pizzeria. Now, mind you, it's raining so hard. You just stepped out of, I stepped out of the car and I was drenched, like I'd have a shower. And the, the lightning was, uh, it was frightening and the thunder was crashing. So I walked into Little, Little Joe's Pizzeria and there in the foyer is a, on the magazine rack, is a copy of the New York Post. No relation, obviously, but that's sort of, you know, a, it's a newspaper, a local newspaper in New York. And the, the only article on the front page, it was a big picture of Governor Spitzer in his socks and his underwear. And it said, Governor no more. And he had just been uh, you know, uh, identified in some sleazy hotel in Manhattan. And what was even worse was that he was using taxpayer money for these particular endeavors. <clears throat> and so at that point, Governor Patterson, who was a blind African-American guy, actually pretty good governor, he became governor. But I realized at, at that, as I walked through that, that foyer that, you know, the whole reason why I had made this trip on Route 80 you know, to New York and to Stony Brook, that that had just kind of fallen apart. And, um, and then something even more exceptional happened. So there was this really crazy little paper that's all over the North Shore of Long Island from like Manhattan all the way out to Montauk and Orient Point. It's called the Three Village Herald. It's the other paper on the rack. This was synchronicity. It had to have been, it had to have been set up by the universe. So there is the one headline on the front page of the Three Village Herald, and it says, you're gonna, you're gonna cry or laugh when I tell you this. It says, Un it's incredible, unlimited love comes to Stony Brook. <laughs> and some, some cub reporter had realized that, you know, I had done stuff like, you know, Dr. Oz and a lot of a lot of stuff, you know, the Daily Show, <clears throat> and so she she really dug into that, and the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Right? She had really gone into that, and she'd interviewed the dean of this medical school, Richard Fine, who is a quite interesting guy, fairly secular, and he's a kidney pediatric transplant surgeon of great distinction, <clears throat> and he'd hired me. And she actually went to his office and said, well, did you know that, you know, this guy is the president of the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love? And, and Dean Fine said, well, I wasn't fully aware of that, but, you know, we, we didn't quite hire him for that purpose. So, so he, he handled it. Then they actually went to my department chair, who's still my department chair, Iris Granick. Same thing. She said, well, can't do any harm. So there was this incredible article in the paper. And... The, the next day, I was a little miffed anyway because of what happened with Elliot Spitzer. So I called the president of the university, Shirley Kenny, <clears throat> and I said, Shirley, um, that's too bad about Spitzer, isn't it? She said, yeah, it really is because he was going to be helpful. So we, I let that go. She couldn't control it. And I said, did you get a load of the Three Village Herald? And she said, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> and then I asked her, well, did you get any response? And she said, yeah, you know, I got a lot of phone calls from emeritus professors. And I said, well, what did they tell you? And she said, well, most of them were male emeritus professors. And they're asking me, what kind of love are we talking about? So the first day I came to, I actually came into the medical school. <clears throat> There's escalators that go up from one floor to the other. They're like the social space, the pro-social space. <clears throat> um, you got to read Esther Sternberg, Healing Spaces, uh, to, to understand that. <clears throat> and so there's this guy up at the top of the escalator. I, I haven't been in the building before. And he's got, he looks like Mr. Clean. He's got pr pretty burly arms and, and he's looking down at me and I just think he's eyeballing me and I've never seen the guy before. <clears throat> and so I, I, I got about two thirds the way up the escalator and I said, sir, may I help you? And he said, and he had a very deep Eastern European ac accent. He was actually Israeli and Czech or something like that. And he said, 
are you Dr. Post? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, are you going to save us? <laughs> and I thought, I said, no, I'm not sure about that, sir, but I'm going to do my best. And we've been very good friends. He's actually a great uh, violinist and, and a good guy. And he has a sense of humor. <clears throat> but um, that was like the first day on the job, you know. And, and when I say like, not always good things happen to good. I, I mean, bad things, difficulties come into everybody's life. But that's why in Route 80, I, you know, I talk about life as an expanding canvas. So I thought, you know, okay, I don't have money from the governor. I got a medical environment with a lot of very talented scientists, and they all tend to be pretty materialistic in their view of the world. And they don't necessarily think that they need an unlimited love guy floating around the institution. So, so I started off in a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a hole, but you know, it's kind of like a Jackson Pollock painting. So when Jackson Pollock started a painting, you know, he did those paintings out on a barn floor in uh, East Hampton, uh, about 50 miles east of here. He'd lay this big canvas on the floor and he'd throw down a gob of ugly paint and it looked like hell, you know. But by the time he covered it over with these very energetic, mystical lines of amazing color and pattern, um, it was beautiful. So when I say life is an expanding canvas, you know, there's, there's nothing, nothing that happens to us. And I don't say this to be glib because there are difficult things that happen, but there's nothing that happens that cannot be actively expanded. I mean, it depends on how we respond to it, you know, and we don't want to go down that sort of negative vortex into bitterness and hostility, but we want to, you know, in a Route 80 style, we want to respond to things, even the difficult things. And so I'm one of these people who really believes that, you know, our adversaries are God's gifts, called a source, a higher being, whatever you want to think about, um, the presence, uh, ultimate reality, Sir John would say, ultimate reality. Um, <clears throat> But, um, you know, uh, David needed Goliath. Um, uh, Joseph needed his brothers. They sold him into slavery. They threw him in a hole in the ground, a well, and then they sold him. <clears throat> but he winds up um, in, uh, in Egypt, and you know the rest of the story. Um, so we all have adversaries. And, you know, loving your enemies doesn't mean that you, you like them doesn't mean that you're calling them up and saying, let's have a cup of coffee. But it means that you can allow them to bring out the best in you. That's how it's always been for me. And so uh, not in a sense of sort of, you know, vindictiveness at all, but just that, you know, um, the, this will bring out the best in me. And so um, despite those difficult beginnings here at Stony Brook, you know, I made an effort every day to really reach out and connect with this community and to become a kind of caregiver for everybody involved. And, um, and so you can win with love. You, you can always win with love. It may not be easy, but you can win with love. And, and you know, there are always, um, sometimes there are real sharks in the water. You, you Australians know about that. Um, I mean, one of my, my other favorite quote, <clears throat> other than Eleanor Roosevelt, um, is from a theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr. <clears throat> There's a street named after him uh, up at Columbia, 117th Street, Reinhold Niebuhr placed, Place. <clears throat> and he said, and this is metaphorical, of course, not literal, but he said, the children of light must have the cunning of the children of darkness, but none of their malice. It's a very interesting statement. The children of light must have the cunning of the children of darkness, but none of their malice. And so I, I really believe in cunning and, and, and being cunning at times because um, 
sometimes the you know the odds are really stacked against me and these I've, I've succeeded 35 years in U of Chicago Case Western Michigan Stony Brook places that um, have huge egomaniacs running around and um, and so yeah I mean I I, I think that um, you have to believe in your dreams and you have to be sometimes pretty clever. I don't know why I just got off on that. I'm sorry, but anyway. Please, do you know what? That is ultimate reality and you're the conduit facilitating exactly what is needed right here and right now for every single one of us in this moment. It literally takes my breath away. Okay. You know, it's interesting. Um, Stephen, I was reading about technology founders in this transformative technology space that I exist in, right? And I was seeing these words like biohacking. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, I know that there is this research around sugar and its contribution to Alzheimer's. Yeah. And why is it as a society, we worry about the foods that we eat more than the emotions that we experience? And I started thinking about, well, neuroscience is the brain and that's different to the mind and neuro, that's really a Latin. So I just, and I do not know why this hasn't occurred to me in the last couple of decades, but anyway, I Googled the Latin for mind, mm -hmm. like literally only two or three days ago. <laughs> and it, I love Google now with its translations and the way that it actually talks to you and, and it says anymore. Right. And then I look down and I see that animus is soul, mind, heart, mm. affections, purpose mm. and feeling. And I'm like, if only we all understood the mind is not this thing in the head. Mm -hmm. Right. There is such a um, appetite for cutting short to get to the outcomes and that's why biohacking is sexy and favorable and i and, and of course i sit here with positive prime and i go is it really that important like why are we positively priming why is that even necessary how do we help people to appreciate the grandeur of no. the activity well, I prime every morning. That's what I do at five o'clock. You know, I'm priming, and 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 in terms of mind and and what it means, you know, I mean, in 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 today's world and culture, I'm surrounded by neuroscientists, um, and that's okay. I mean, I appreciate them, but um, you know, at Columbia University, there's a wonderful woman there named Lisa Miller who wrote a best-selling book called The Spiritual Child. And she started a great organization um, uh, of uh, scientists who are great scientists, but they're non-materialists. So that's people like Larry Dossi and Deepak Chopra and uh, Sheldrake, all these people who believe in non-local mind, that, there's a, a, that our minds are not just matter or even derivable from matter, um, no matter what the evolutionary folks say. And even great philosophers point this out, that it's just incredibly challenging to imagine that, that mind could emerge from matter. So the great traditions of the world, you know, Hinduism, for example, um, you have the um, supreme being who is pure mind and pure love and pure creativity who exists completely beyond time and and space but through the big bang which is nicely captured in the upanishads brings a universe into being um, which is fine-tuned john barrow by the way the cambridge um, mathematician who was a good friend and a Templeton Prize laureate. He died just a month ago. He's only 57. But he wrote a book called The Anthropic Principle about how the constants, the dynamics, 
the mathematical principles of the universe are somehow set up in such a way as to eventually give rise to an intelligent life form, or at least um, the earthen vessel for the spirit. And um, so, so I'm one of these mind before matter type people. And the reason I am that way, and I finally decided I was going to explain it. <clears throat> That's why I wrote God and Love on Route 80. I, you know, I wrote it because I, I, I know so many people <clears throat> who have had these incredible experiences of synchronicity and they feel like somehow that perfect person at that perfect moment, as if an answer to a prayer just was there on their journey. And it, it was beyond chance, you know, um, that it, it was so incredibly perfect that it had to have been somehow orchestrated by a very cherishing mind and presence in the universe. So, you know, I love Carl Jung's book on synchronicity where he's sitting with a patient in his office and <clears throat> he's not getting any place with her therapeutically, uh, but she tells him about a dream she had that previous night. And it was a dream of a really rare silver beetle uh, in Northern Europe. And uh, just as she's telling him that, that dream, he hears a little tapping on his window in his office. Some of you know this story. And, and he turns around and he looks and there is this rare beetle, unbelievably rare beetle. And he puts it in his hand, it just falls into his hand. And then he turns, he swivels his chair around and he presents it to his patient. And she's like totally floored by this. And at that point, um, they have this therapeutic breakthrough. And so he spoke of synchronicity as uncaused causality, capital U, capital C, uncaused causality, a special kind of causality, if you will, that is a complete mystery. And um, so, you know, the, 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 this will, some of you will w want to turn this off, but I, I was actually born on Long Island, ironically. And I went up to a high school in New Hampshire. As I mentioned, St. Paul's, which is a Episcopal place. And I was always reading um, mystical writings and scriptures and things like that. And I loved sacred studies. Uh, we had great teachers up there. And when I was 15 years old, uh, I had a dream one morning. And it was, you know, I didn't know what to make of it, but it was, it was odd. It recurred six times over the next year. And it was all pretty much exactly the same. <clears throat> and what happened was I would see this road and I knew it was toward the West and it was foggy. It was just covered with uh, cloud and fog and mist. And I couldn't see very far, but at a certain point I looked to my left and I saw the face of a young man with really stringy, gnarly blonde hair. And he was leaning over a ledge as if to jump. And then all the mist dissipated and I saw the face of this beautiful feminine figure, not angel wings or anything like that, but just something that looked angelic to me. And she said in a very kind and soothing way, if you save him, you too shall live. And then the dream ended. <clears throat> um, you know, the, there was blue and, and, and it, she disappeared. So my sacred studies teacher, my, 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 my teacher Rod Wells was a big friend of Alan Watts, who was an Episcopal priest and a Buddhist out in San Francisco. <clears throat> and uh, he really liked Jung and he was very interested in the idea of a universal mind, a collective unconscious that we don't understand very well. So I would talk about this dream in his class with our, with students. And that included, by the way, Charlie Scribner, who's, you know, the, you know, the Scribner publishers and Gary Trudeau and Dunes, I mean, all these people. So they all knew me as, and, and, and they, 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 you know, we talked about this dream and they asked me, so do you think it meant anything? And I said, well, I don't know. It's probably just, you know, I was raking too many leaves in the hot 
son working off demerits, or maybe I had a dyspeptic hot dog. And, and I, was, I was willing to say that, you know, human beings, I mean, this is where the existentialists are, true, are right. You know, we're desperately meaning-seeking creatures. And if we don't have meaning, it's kind of hard to go on. So I could understand that maybe this was just me conjuring this stuff up. But the fact that it repeated itself six times really struck me. And then Rod, who was a graduate of Yale Divinity School in New Haven, he decided one day, like a year later, that we would go down to Yale Divinity School. And he, he, he knew that a teacher named Jim Diddies who taught a course on adolescent spirituality. Because, you know, most people blow up adolescent spirituality and think it's just garbledygook and trivial and crazy. <clears throat> but uh, he took me seriously. So we went down there and I, I did like a three-hour response to this group of 15 Masters of Divinity students who were training for the ministry. And they were asking me all kinds of questions about the dream. And they said, so what did, what did it mean to you? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm really not sure if it meant anything, but, um, you know, I said, um, we all read Emerson up there at St. Paul's. We all read the essay on the oversoul. And we all know it's a beautiful piece of work, but I think I'm maybe the only person who actually believes in the oversoul. So I believe that our mind is just part of this oversoul. And, um, and you know, we have some small gift. So we're, in, we're, 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 we're discreet, but we're, we're also part of a universal mind. It's, it's kind of a paradox. <clears throat> and I explained that to them and they, and they said, we, we talked about it for a while. And then they said, so did this dream make you do anything? And I said, yeah, actually I did something really strange because most of the kids from St. Paul's, you know, they went to only East Coast colleges. So I applied, I said, I applied to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. What's left of it now? I don't know. <clears throat> but um, um, I just said, because I felt that somehow I had to go to the West. And then, so then, you know, I, you know, we went to the chapel at the Divinity School. I played a little uh, Bach on the classical guitar and we went back to New Hampshire. Fast forward two years. So I'm headed to Swarthmore in Philadelphia for college. And um Rod Wells had gotten me a job in the Bronx tutoring, and I liked tutoring kids. And I did that in New Hampshire with French and Canadian kids. And, um, you know, played a lot of ice hockey, by the way, with Boom Boom, Jeffreyon, Rocket Richard, all this really great stuff. And, and so um, I, I've got this job lined up, and, and, and I'm sitting with my parents, and they say, we're not going to let you go to the Bronx because it's too dangerous. And I said, Mom. It's not dangerous. It's an okay part of the Bronx. Nope, we've looked into it. You can't do it. And so we had this pretty serious argument. I, I, I can use knockdown, drag out, if you don't mind, for about two days. And finally, my mother said, look, Stevie, if, if, if you insist on this, we're not going to cover you for Swarthmore. And, uh, and I finally, I relented. And uh, I said, okay, I won't teach in the Bronx, but it is very, it's, it's really terrible. And I should, you, you shouldn't be bothering me about this. Um, what, what am I going to do? Now, my dad, he was the president of a department store on Fifth Avenue called W&J Sloan's. And at that time, it was kind of, well, it's, it's gone under, but it was across from Scribner's bookstore, <clears throat> uh, which is now Tiffany's. And... Uh, he knew all the manufacturers around Long Island and New York. So he said, I'll get you a job. You can work in Bill De Bono's lampshade factory. Oh my God. So I actually had met Bill De Bono once and he had, you know, always smoking these big stogies and he was a big, wonderful Italian guy. And he had a lampshade factory in Patchogue on the South shore of Long Island. So I started driving dad's, secondhand Mercedes 190, which has seen a lot better days. Um, and it was in and out of the shops to the pet, to the, to the build a bono lampshade factory. And I was cutting cardboard on an assembly line, basically making, you know, and I was, you know, interacting with these, they were good salt of the earth people. I had no, no problem with that. It was fine, but I just didn't think it was my thing. And I was upset about not being tutoring that summer. 
<clears throat> so one Friday night, two weeks into it, I, I drove out to West Hampton Beach, which is like, again, you know, 60 miles out further. And um, I had a couple of friends from school who lived out there. And on a Friday night, I, I had my copy of Siddhartha. I had my classical guitar. I had 40 bucks in my wallet. I said, you know, I don't really need to go to college. If there's just one mind, I really don't need to go to college. <clears throat> Plus, I'm not really happy working in Bill's lampshade factory. So I'm going to follow my dream. So I got in that car and I started driving west. And I drove west on the Sunrise Highway. I drove through the Midtown Tunnel. I drove to the George Washington Bridge. I'd never been west over the bridge before, but I knew that was west. So I drove over the bridge and there were two signs immediately. One said 95 South. <laughs> the other said Route 80 West. That's my road. So I started driving west on Route 80. And about five in the morning, I'm in the middle of Pennsylvania. And cars back in those days had something called generators. Some of you know that. And when the generator broke, all the power was out, the light was out, the engine stopped dead. <clears throat> and just, so I was thinking about turning around. I was thinking I'm gonna do a U-turn and go home and my wonderful reputation will be untarnished. However, the universe has something else in mind. So just as I was thinking that, the generator broke and I could just manage to get over on the right shoulder of the, of the, of the highway. There were a lot of, you know, there were trucks around. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty dangerous highway. And what was I going to do? There were just cornfields for miles and miles. This is near the Lewisburg exit. And um, so I did what a, you know, the, the sun was just barely beginning to rise. I did what any uh, kid would do. I took a piece of paper out of the glove compartment and in pencil, I wrote to the Pennsylvania State Police. This is actually in the book, to the Pennsylvania State Police. Please return this car to Henry A. V. Post, 44 Davison Lane East, West Islip, New York, 516-669-5655. From his son, Stephen, who no longer works in the lampshade factory. <laughs> now, this is a confession. I mean, anybody could slap me for this, and I would accept it as just. <clears throat> and... And so I had my guitar and my cigar, and I put my thumb out. I put the I put the note, at, you know, uh, right under the windshield wiper. And uh, this big truck came by. I won't go into it, but I I I wind up. I'm heading west, hitchhiking out to the west, and I'm actually in just in front of Lincoln, Nebraska, still on Route 80. And this young lady who I had met in, uh, in, in Chicago and was going west with in a VW microbus with four or five other people in her crowd, she said, you know, maybe you should call your mother because I told her the story. So we pulled by a phone booth and of course I called collect. And my mother, mother said, Stevie, you're alive. And I said, mom, yeah, I'm alive. And she said, we can call off the Pinkertons. Now, the Pinkertons, for those of you who know, are detectives, right? And I said, Mom, why did you call the Pinkertons? Didn't you get my note? Again, that deserves another slap. So this is partly a confession. <laughs> and anyway, I made my way out west, <clears throat> and I spent the summer with my cousin George Lamont in the Mission District, playing classical guitar in Hispanic restaurants and having a great time. And there was a Nichiren Shoshu Buddhist temple down on Market Street in Chenery. So I was there, I joined and I was chanting Nam Yoho Renge Kyo with those big wooden beads. And it was very mystical when everybody's doing that together and you get this flow feeling, sort of like Chick Sent Me High would talk about, you know, you beyond time, beyond place. It's really cool. <clears throat> and uh, I drew a really bad number for the draft. So I didn't want to go to Vietnam, and I called the people at Reed College, because I turned them down months ago. I said, look, I'm wondering if you would possibly consider opening up a place for me. And they said, yeah, we'll do that. So early in September, out in front, about 7 in the morning, in front of the Nichiren Shosho Buddhist Temple, with George and Gus and some other people, they gave me a gift 
a departure gift, and it's called a gohon zone. A gohon zone, you can Google it, is a scroll. It's a Japanese Buddhist scroll. And this guy named Gus was an old man and a mentor to me. He'd been interned in Hawaii, was Japanese American. Um, <clears throat> he explained the symbols to me. I was very impressed. So, that, so I, you know, I did have to pay $50 for my gohon zone, and I gave him $50, and I put it in my backpack. And I took the Market Street bus and I got over to um, Golden Gate Park and I walked across the park, it's a big walk, and there's the, um, the opening of uh, the red opening of the Golden Gate Bridge. I walked up and it was very cloudy. It was, you know, I, I literally could not see more than about a, you know, two feet in front of my nose. I walked up to the to to the to the middle of the of, of, it's a single arch bridge so the middle of the arch, and I heard something very strange. It was like a rustling, and it was to my left. I was on the walkway, and this was on the left of the railing, and the railing was only like waist high. I was actually in San Francisco a year ago, and now they have like big, high you know head high railings and all kinds of nets because they don't want people jumping off the bridge. But I, I looked over there and I, I, I saw the face of a young guy with dirty blonde hair and he was leaning over and it looked like he was about to jump. So I looked at him and he actually caught me out of the corner of his eye and he looked very angry and indignant. And I said to him, I truly hope that you're not planning to jump. I just said it very calmly very calm. And, um, and he said, what's it to you? And then he started quoting like from Macbeth, life's empty, nothingness. I mean, he's a pretty brilliant guy. And I said, but wait a minute. I think I came all the way out here to meet you right here in this very spot. And I told him that I'd had a dream two years earlier, 3,000 miles away. And that I thought that I had seen him in this dream. And I told him about the, the lampshade factory. <laughs> I told him about going to Yale Divinity School. I told him about the note I wrote to the Pennsylvania State Police. I told him about calling mom from Lincoln, Nebraska. I told him all these details, which took about a half an hour and kind of calmed him down. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you are crazier than I am. And I said to him, well, yeah, that's probably true because we're all looking for meaning. But I said, you're out there and I'm at least, you know, I'm on the walkway. And so we carried on a conversation. <clears throat> and then I said, look, um, what's your name? His name was Harry. I said, if, if you come off the ledge, come over the railing and stand here next to me, I'm going to give you something that's going to change your luck. You know, because the Buddhist tradition has all kinds of like lucky charms, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something for free that's going to turn your life around. <clears throat> so he said, what's that? And I pulled my gahon zone out from my backpack and I unscrolled it. And I said, well, this symbol means infinite mind. And this symbol means connectedness, that we're all connected. And this symbol means mystery. So we're all connected in the mystery of an unlimited mind. And I said, uh, you are too. And we are too. And I said, if we weren't connected in that way, you know, I wouldn't be here. Because I had that dream 3,000 miles away in two years ago. So he came over and I, 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 I explained a little further. And I said, here, you can have this scroll. I rolled it up. I gave it to him. His name was Harry. I said, but here's the deal. You have to walk south on the bridge through Golden Gate Park, take the bus and go to Chenry Street. And I wrote a note, which is in the book. Dear Cousin George, this is Harry. Please let him sleep on the floor where I slept on the floor. Take him over to the temple. Let him meet Gus. Look after him. <clears throat> now, I never saw Harry after that, although, as it turns out, he did go back to North Carolina um, in the in the fall before I actually got I, I went back just to, to uh, San Francisco for Thanksgiving break from Oregon so I walked north on the, on, on the bridge and as I walked north um, 
so now I'm going down the, on the main uh, arch. <clears throat> all the clouds, all the mist, uh, it all just dissipated. And there was this incredibly bright, radiant blue sky. I mean, like radiant blue sky. And I thought to myself, you know, um, there is this one mind and we are all more connected than we know. That's why the, the subtitle of Rude 8, God, Love, and Rude 8 is the hidden mystery of human connectedness. And I felt like somehow my dream had been a premonition and it had come true. And um, so that was like, you know, the book is like a series of 12 episodes of synchronicity and premonition. But as I walked north on that, because I was catch, I was going to hitchhike, and I did hitchhike. I got a ride in a farmer's truck up to Portland. Um, I just felt somehow completely different. I, w I was transformed. I, you know, I, up until that time, I always wondered about the dream. Was this just, you know, a lucid imagination? Um, was there something in the water in New Hampshire? What was it? But uh, I, at that point, I believed that there really is this infinite mind. You can call it an original mind. You can call it the supreme being. Call it what you will. But somehow or another, um, I was out there for a reason. <clears throat> and that shaped my entire life. So the idea of, you know, if you save him, you, you shall live. So I spent all my life, um, you know, if... 35 years in, in medical schools, among other things, <clears throat> you know, just trying to teach people about the healing power of love. And there have been a, a number of adolescents, uh, adolescent males who, who I've helped uh, through periods of suicidal ideation. And I've, you know, I just spent a lot of time, you know, working with the deeply forgetful and, and, um, and so my whole life, you know, I mean, you have to really just put any kind of success I've had on the shelf because it's it's not really my success. I've just been following my dream. <clears throat> and that I could tell that to people like Mersha Eliade and Joseph Campbell in the Swift Kick coffee shop. You know, that was a real treat. And I've never, I've never left the dream. Ah, oh, here to dreams. Here's to dreams. Um, that has been beautiful and captivating. There are so many people who have loved listening. I would um, dare imagine that we could do a regular listening to Stephen. Um, you seriously don't do that, right? It's yeah. just while we've got the opportunity to record in technologies like Zoom, we should really harness the chance. Um, it's a funny thing because some this is a medical school, and <laughs> and and I I have, you know I mean this is a great medical school. I mean the the MRI was was invented across the hallway by a lotterer who and who had a, a inspiration at a coffee shop near Stony Brook and developed this thing. And the first creature to ever uh, have an MRI scan was a clam from the beach down the road here, okay? The guy won the Nobel Prize for that. So, I mean, these people are serious scientists. And and they we get along, and I do a lot of good things with them. But they, they know there's this side of me. And so, I you know, but I've been, I've been really, it's been refreshing. I've been so, I've been able to be so open through writing God and Love on Route 80. It's why I wrote it. I wrote, I wrote it because I wanted to be free. But I also wrote it for all the people who have had these unbelievably uncanny experiences. And, you know, 80% of people, we did a national survey uh, that was actually published uh, in, a, in, a, in a book uh, called The Heart of Religion, which I have a copy of here. You know, it's right, actually right, right here. This was a national survey of American adults, coast to coast, random survey. And we asked them, how they experienced God, 80% of them said that they had deep experiences of God on a fairly regular basis. And they had all different kinds of concepts of God. <clears throat> but 
Uh, you know, almost all of them said that their primary experiences of this divine entity came through others. So they're talking about synchronicity. They're talking about somehow in a moment of desperation, maybe in a desperate detour, you gotta have detours on Route 80, you know, um, somehow that perfect person at that perfect moment was, was there and literally saved their lives. You know, like I had encountered Harry on the Golden Gate Bridge. And so people have all these incredible stories uh, about these things. So it's not that weird, but everybody's so damn scared to talk about it because you know what? There, I mean, at least in the academic world, it's the materialistic paradigm that dominates. And so, you know, I'm a little older now and I'm tenured and you know, pretty well established. And so people are willing to kind of tolerate me, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this for, you know, an assistant professor. <laughs> well, <laughs> Alrighty. So do you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do a poll of the number of people who want you back. Did you see Patty's actually just said, um, we could do a quarterly Stephen post night of stories, inspiration, love books, and on and on. Thank you. Um, thank you. You bring tears to my eyes. Um, here at Positive Prime as a professional community, we are really committed to our own forms of giving and being kind and um, priming ourselves to be our best. Uh, we really truly are. And we love to be able to understand some of these scientific outcomes of these papers so that we can go and share the message. One of the other interesting things about academia is that often the authors and their family members are the only people who read these papers and they need to be understood by audiences far and wide. They need to be applied. You know, they need to be lived or brought to life by real people, you know, for those of us who have real opportunities and real problems and live in the real world. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's really, it's what I'm committed to doing. Do you know, I already know that the next night is going to be about volunteerism because oh, um, it's important that we understand why it's actually really good for us. So yes. do you want to give us a little teaser? And of course, you know, this is my way of asking, will you return and not sure, putting yeah. you on the spot? <laughs> well, for Kim, for, for Kim and for all of you, you know, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to, to, to come back and um, share more. I, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in rigorous science and there's been so much good work done around the benefits of giving and volunteering. So I got here to Stony Brook, so it was 2008. And there was a financial downturn that year. And a lot of people lost their jobs. So in, in America anyway, on an average year, you've got about 35% of people who actually volunteer formally in some way or another. Um, so it, um, in early 2010, so in 2009, United Healthcare got in touch with me and they said, okay, let's find out if it's really good to be good because I've been writing these books and these articles and, and, and you know, in, in serious scientific journals. And this has gotten a lot of traction. Because I'm uh, the first article I wrote, it, 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 you know, uh, 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 altruism and health, it's good to be good, which was like the first one and one of, really, I think, the first one in the field. It's been cited like you know a thousand times, and it's kind of a benchmark. And and uh, so they um, um, they they said let's do a national survey. So in early 2010, we did a survey of um, 5,000 adult Americans, random survey, <clears throat> and we asked them, did you volunteer in 2009? So it was looking back to the previous year. 41% of them had volunteered. And then we asked, so how much? And um, on average, it was 100 hours per year. So if you wanted to, you could break that down, you know, and you could say, okay, so they were volunteering a couple of hours a week. 
And then we ask them, you know, typical questions. So did this make you feel happier? You know, 96% made me feel happier. Uh, did this make you feel physically healthier? About, you know, close to 80%. Did um, this make it easier for you to deal with loss and disappointments? You know, 88%. Um, did this allow you to establish deeper friendships? You know, yes, you know, huge percentages. <clears throat> uh, did this make you more resilient? And, I mean, it was incredible. I mean, if you could package all this in a pill and sell it, it would be like you'd be a millionaire overnight. And um, so um, that was very powerful. And we're just actually beginning a program now with managed healthcare systems in the US on uh, pro-social prescribing, prescribing pro-sociality because the evidence is so ample now. I mean, there's, you know, so much good stuff about this that, um, you know, they're using it in, say, adolescent psychiatry. So, you know, you've got an adolescent with a lot of malaise and struggle and affluenza and kind of running on empty and maybe prone to drug abuse or whatever. You know, you want to build within your clinical setting an opportunity for them to be engaged in volunteering activities in meaningful venues, maybe with a good mentor, non-parent mentor. So we're actually doing that in a few places experimentally in Cincinnati, Children's and elsewhere. <clears throat> and there are geriatric clinics. Think about old folks, say, oh, they, they, they need meals on wheels. <clears throat> but actually um, they do some, but they also need opportunities to contribute to the lives of others. And when they do that, the literature is phenomenal about how much better they do psychologically and even physically. So, I mean, within limits, obviously people can only do so much. Um, <clears throat> but I think we're at a point now where we really have to start to think about how to uh, get this work into clinical environments in a meaningful uh, way. But, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I'm just grabbing stuff down here. So, uh, <clears throat> I did a book with, with Oxford in, I think 2007 called Altruism in Health, Perspectives from Empirical Research. <clears throat> it's just the whole book about the, um, the scientific side of this. It actually has a lot of chapters written by other people. <clears throat> so I, you know, I, I asked people, you know, really prominent people, um, I mean, in positive psychology, people like George Valiant and, <clears throat> um, I mean, it's a long list, Mike McCullough. And, um, you know, everybody, uh, Howard Co ha Harold Koenig, um, they all wrote beautiful um, original chapters about about the science um, that, you know, it's it's good to be good. But again, you know, in a medical center, I have to be, I'm careful about how I handle this because I don't want to, you know, people are already involved in helping professions. And so a lot of their issue is, well, can they get enough time for a little balance in their life? Can they get a chance to walk in the forest? Can they connect with their families? Can they have balance? You know, are they being run ragged? <clears throat> so you don't want to add volunteerism to that. And yet I must say that you know we, we were we we've been I think we had more COVID patients than all but three other hospitals in America. This was the total epicenter for all of Long Island. I mean, at one point there were 700 patients in the intensive care unit many of whom, by the way, needed clinical ethical counseling in their, I mean, their adult children and so forth. And, and so that was, you know, a constant practice for like six months, which was really quite remarkable. Uh, but uh, the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the students were, <clears throat> a lot of them, they couldn't be in the clinics. They, 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 they were Zooming their classes. So they did volunteering to kind of cope with that feeling of isolation because somehow they, and they did both. Sometimes they would just, you know, work with the family. Sometimes they would, they would, you know, provide various necessities to uh, families around, around Stony Brook and greater Long Island who were impoverished. They did a lot of really cool things. <clears throat> and they're do they're finishing up a really great study now about, volunteering and coping, which I think is going to be very powerful. But I have to tell you, I got to leave you with a funny story. So a couple of my friends 
um, here, wrote an article on widows and widowers. Okay. And, and you know, caveat, married for a long time and pretty happily, okay? Because, I mean, it's not like they were high hostels, right? Uh, you know, ramping up their, uh, their, uh, 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 their, their stress um, and, and, you know, ready to bail. But these were people who really had, they were high quartile, happy married people. <clears throat> and what we discovered is that um, when a spouse passed away, um, they did better if they could self-report that they were either formally volunteering or informally doing so, like, you know, just through some neighborhood association or maybe their spiritual community, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and so we published an article in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a very prominent journal, and this got around. So it turns out oh, yeah, there's a New York Society of Widows and Widowers. I'd never heard of anything like this. And... Um, so I get a phone call. I'm sitting here at my desk, I get a phone call. They say, you know, that's really interesting. Would you come and give a plenary address at our annual meeting in New York? So I went into this Marriott Hotel in the middle of Manhattan. There was this big ballroom for like, you know, a thousand or two widows and widowers. And I gave this talk. It went pretty well. And then at the end, there was plenty of time for Q&A. And <clears throat> there was this guy in the back of the room. I could just make him out, you know. And he was frantically waving his hands. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, and this is a quote. He said, I don't care what you say, buddy. I don't do nothing for nothing. I knew I wasn't in Cleveland. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, what, what happens there is that people get into this sort of tough guy, um, tit for tat, I'm not a sucker, uh, calculating reciprocity and if if it's not there i don't do it and i what i couldn't get through uh uh for this fellow was that his freedom would come not from tit for tat calculations but from just kind of putting that on the shelf i mean maybe some benefits might come as a byproduct but don't anticipate it necessarily <clears throat> but the benefits would come more internally, that he would be freed from a lot of these difficult, hostile, negative states by just reaching out and helping others. And you know, we, I, when I, was, I was on the board of the Templeton Foundation, and, and, and it was, I actually was the one who approved the Shambhala project that did all the work with the advanced Tibetan Buddhist meditators in the Rockies, working with UC Davis. It's very controversial, but I, I insisted that we approve. We approve it's a lot of money, and they are the ones who did all the studies on sort of medita you know, kindness meditations, loving kindness meditations, and even telomeric influence, and all the biomarker stuff came out of that, which is really cool. Um, but you know, you don't have to go to the Rocky Mountains and meditate for you know X number of months. All you really have to do is just right here in this moment, this is like tikkun alam, you know, in the Jewish tradition, you just have to have confidence that you're the right person in the right place to help the person who's right next to you. Maybe not perfectly, but you can do reasonably well. <clears throat> and to be kind, just to be kind, you know, it's better to be always kind and always right. Think about that. There's something to leave you with. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and if you just engage in those activities, um, it, in, you know, it, it brings you into a different emotional space. And again, that's the James Lang theory of, of emotional transformation. So that's another way to do it. And that's why I say, you know, it's good to be good and good. You know, I mean, I, li I like the meditational stuff and the internal stuff and I do it, but I also recognize that just the action itself, not, not everybody, but two thirds of people will have an emotional transformation through the action. There's still that recalcitrant third, and maybe they're like Ivan Illich. I don't know. Oh, you gotta keep trying. You gotta, yeah, keep, gotta keep trying. trying. Yeah. Get a pacemaker. <laughs> just, exactly. <laughs> just teasing. Yeah. Exactly. You've always been very kind, Kim, I have to say that. 
Oh, thank you so much. But I, I can I can do so much better and I continue to commit to do so much better um, or more of. Uh, and there are the parts of me that I'm shocked by. And then there are the parts of me that I'm in awe of. And just so long as we spend more time in the latter. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, I do believe that there are interventions that actually help us. To your point, um, and because we're closing out, I'm sure that everybody's going to be a lot more cognizant now that when they watch our programs, our positive prime sessions, <clears throat> they will see the deliberate attempt that Mayumi and I, as a team, we actually curate a, a, quite a significant amount of images that oh. represent pro-social behavior. Yeah. And we believe that if you see a lot of pro-social behavior in 1000 <clears throat> flashcards every single day, you will actually, from a mirror neurons point of view, yeah. start to behave in ways that are actually more generative. And if we can make that tiny little contribution, yes, I um, I wrote this. If my time had have actually been up, that's okay, right? Then yeah, good you, you've been good at that. You've been good at good at those cards, and I, I love those. You know, I, it's so nice to see see Kim because we, we somehow we've always connected and it's a beautiful thing but um, before I go can I read you one brief paragraph please this is so this is from God and Love on Route 80 you know you see the blue angel stuff and some of you you know you've heard of W.H. Auden um, who I mentioned earlier you know wrote the, the Age of Anxiety so he hung around Oxford University a lot he was kind of a I don't know. He was kind of an old hippie, and he, he he he. Everybody loved his poetry, and they would gather around in coffee shops and and you know, in the chapels and listen to him. So listen, this is just one brief paragraph. But if if you don't think that this can be real, just listen to this. So he says, one fine night in June of 1933, I was sitting on a lawn after dinner with three colleagues two women and one man. We liked each other well enough, but we're certainly not intimate friends, nor had any one of us a sexual interest in another. Incidentally, we had not drunk any alcohol. We were talking casually about everyday matters when quite suddenly and unexpectedly something happened. I felt myself invaded by a power which though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not mine. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to the power I was doing it, what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself. I was also certain, though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my three colleagues were having the same experience. In the case of one of them, I was able later to confirm this. My personal feelings toward them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends, but I felt their existence as themselves to be of infinite value, and I rejoiced in it. It doesn't get any better than that. That's unlimited love. It's not coming from us. It can invade our lives and it can do it now, and you don't even have to wait, just notice it and celebrate it. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. On that note, <clears throat> um, we'll all go out, if we haven't already, and buy your book and read it and share it, and we'll see you for the next Stephen Post night. Okay. <laughs> Love you. Take care. You too. You too. You know. Bye. Yep. Hey, by the way, what did the Pacific Ocean say to the Atlantic Ocean? Nothing. It just waved. That's a, uh. that's a Zoom thing. That's a Zoom thing. I'm just waving. See you, Michael. <laughs> okay. See you. All right. Donna, Maury, okay. be good. Fiona, Patty. Okay. Take care. God bless. See ya. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.